I'd like to start by telling you I'm not a techie. I'm not someone who's spent a lot of time working with technology for years. I'm an early childhood teacher by training. I've taught different primary year levels all the way up to year seven. And um, technology was never big on my radar. I had many other things I was doing until one day I injured my shoulder and I had about six months where I could not write on the board. And so my school gave me a data projector and a computer and said, here you go, work with this and then you won't be keep inflaming your arm when you write on the board. And that was the beginning of my journey about 12 years ago with technology. So I, I tell you this for a couple of reasons. I'm listening to you sit, sitting here today and some people are quite nervous. There's no magical gene that makes you good at technology. It's not something you're born with, you know. It's not Maybelline and all those things. It's actually about doing and trying and having a go and having a practice and making mistakes and little bit, little bit, little bit at a time. And um, I sometimes find it quite amazing that, you know, 12 years down the track, here I am leading up digital learning for the office. But I guess my message is, it's doable for everyone. It's all just about having a go. So, my job today is to talk to you about the big picture stuff around learning in a digital world. And um, as you come in today, I'm very aware of a couple of things. I'm aware of your battery life. <laughs> Not only is it Thursday, which means you're a, hmm, the guy over there in the red looking a little bit tragic, but we're also nearly at the end of the term, which means your need for coffee and chocolate is rising steadily. So I am aware of that, so be kind to yourselves and we will be kind to you as we travel. But what I hope for you over these two days is that we can renew your battery life so that you actually head off to the holidays feeling like you've got some things you actually want to implement next term and you're a little bit excited. In journeying today, I wanted to talk to you about three things. Get ready, get set and go. The get ready is really the why and what. Why are we doing this digital learning? Why is it so important? The get set is the how and then some thoughts for the journey as we go. So, let's get started. I want to start with this idea about how we're supporting kids. I mean, our job is to help prepare kids to be fantastic contributors to our society and our economy. You know, we're building people for life, not people to pass test scores. And the big question we always need to have in mind is, are we preparing our kids for now, our present? Are we preparing them for our future? Or are we preparing them for their future? Because, you know, there's a lot of people who go, well, I did this at school this way and I turned out all right. But what we know is that things are changing very rapidly in our society and in our economy. And so we need to look at different ways to support our students as they move forward to make sure we're preparing them to be these active, informed contributors to our world. And what we know is our education system is lagging behind many of the other systems and other areas. And um, we haven't made those significant changes. We're preparing kids really well for an industrial age. Unfortunately, that industrial age doesn't exist anymore. We're now in an information age with an information economy and a very connected society. And some of our big documents that inform what we do in Australia are starting to reflect that. So the Melbourne Declaration came out in two, December 2008 and it sets the direction for schooling in Australia for the next 10 years and it is the basis for the Australian curriculum. And since then, we're now five years into this, so we're halfway through. And I want to share with you a couple of key comp, um, bits out of that Melbourne Declaration. The first is in the preamble. So if we were doing the simple cliff notes for this one, the two key messages are ICT is important and we need to keep increasing our effectiveness. And in the goals, let you have a read again. So we're committed to promoting personalised learning that aims to fulfil the diverse capabilities of each young Australian. So what does this mean? What is this personalised learning? Well, really, it's about mixing together that pedagogy, the curriculum and the learning environments to meet not only the needs of your kids, which is something we're generally good at doing as teachers, but also their aspirations as well. So it's not just what they need, but what they want. And generally, technology is used to facilitate these personal learning environments. So, so really, it's about providing for needs and aspirations. Can I say, as we start, 
that technology is now given. It's not a debate anymore. It's here, it's staying, it's increasingly central to the work we do and we need to move on from is this going to make a difference? We know it's making an impact when used well. And that's why we're all here today because we're all passionate about making sure we're doing the best for our kids. That's why we went into education. So the challenge is how do we use these tools well to make a difference to our kids' learning outcomes? And in the Australian curriculum, which was informed by that Melbourne Declaration, there is the ICT general capability, which I'm sure you've all seen. But really what it does is outline effectively, outline what our students need to learn to effectively to function in a digital world. So let's take a little bit of a closer look. There's five areas. Let's start with investigating ICT. And it's really interesting if you go into the general capability to just look at the verbs. The verbs give you a really good sense of what it's asking you to do. And we've got verbs like define, plan, locate, generate, access, select and evaluate. They're all very active verbs of things that we're asking the students to do. This is the reality for our kids today. When I was growing up, and possibly when you were growing up, depending on your age and where I'm getting older, information was pretty scarce. It was something you had to get from someone who knew it, a professor or a teacher, or from a book. So if you, you know, most of us went down the library, if we had some research to do, or if you were really lucky, you might have had a set of encyclopedias at home. And then, you know, you had the information and the knowledge. That's all changed now. Information is everywhere for our kids. In fact, there's an absolute overload of information. And we now have the opposite problem, which is to help, help, how we help our kids navigate this sea of information that's coming at them at 100 miles an hour, just like the fire hydrant very difficult to drink out of. So one of our jobs is how we support our kids in managing all of this information. And part of that is helping them be critical learners. Because with encyclopedias, someone actually checked the facts. Someone actually made sure what was in there was right. If your librarian had bought books and put them in the library, it was a pretty safe thing that when you opened it, the information would be accurate. That's not necessarily the case on the internet. So part of the skills we now need to be teaching our kids is how to be critical learners, to be looking at information and saying, is this correct? How can I find out? How can I be sure? And I think as teachers, we're really challenged with all of this information around us to look at our own practice. We can't be the gurus anymore. We can't be the ones up the front saying, I have all the knowledge. And it's almost like, open up your head, flip top head, I'll fill you up with it. Now all that information is out there, so we're being challenged as teachers to work in different ways, to think about facilitating the learning, guiding the learning for our kids and curating the information that's out there to work with them. So that's investigating. Then we move on to my favourite, which is creating with ICT. And the number one verb sitting there for creating is generate. And what we know is that it's not a transfer of knowledge, learning. It's actually kids building their own schema of knowledge, of finding out that your students create their own networks of knowledge based on the things they do rather than on the things they see or hear. So our challenge is how do we enable our kids to create? With our technology, we've got a whole heap of opportunities to now do that. We've got images and video and audio, web links, files, courses and e-publications, lots and lots of different ways we can let kids show what they know. And emerge, increasingly emerging is apps, you know, there's this thing out there, program will be programmed. This is the future for our kids. So I think one of the most powerful things we can do as educators is to let our kids demonstrate learning using this technology to show what they know in a variety of different formats. And it's a real shift. I mean, I was working with um, technology 10 years ago as an ICT coordinator in a school, and really it was around consuming. We went online to do research and to find things out. Now it's shifted so much and we're actually sharing our learning online. So, so that's creating. Let's go on to the third one, communicating. Look at our verbs again. Collaborate, share, exchange, understand. 
And there's an increasing number of opportunities for us to communicate and collaborate using our digital tools, whether it's synchronous, which means real time, face to face through video conferencing, or collaborating on a document together We're using something like Google Docs. There's a whole heap of things out there. Or if it's asynchronous, where you're not doing it at the same time and it's more on demand. So if you're emailing each other as a form of reading and writing, if you're participating in forums and commenting on the work of others, sharing work or teaching one another. And I think we're really challenged to say, how can we use these tools not only to share the product of what kids are doing, but also the process, you know. When I think about reporting and, um, you know, I've been in schools that have done, had quite creative forms of reporting. We've had learning journeys and we've had portfolios, parent interviews, as well as the formal report. We were always sharing the product of the kids' learning. Now with all of these digital tools, we can actually capture what they're doing as they learn. And I think that's a really powerful way of connecting with parents and sharing that information, whether it's through digital portfolios, through Twitter, class tweets, class blogs, there's so many opportunities to actually share that journey with families. I think one of, Chris Lehman sums it up really <coughs> well. When we're really challenged now as teachers to get beyond the audience of one. When I was at school, I wrote something and my teacher was the audience. They read it, they marked it and they sent it back. We now have in our hands devices that allow us to give our kids bigger audiences. Their peers can be their audience. Their families can be their audience. Done well, you can take it public and have other schools, other people being their audience through blogs. And I think that changes the whole way kids do things. How motivating is it to write something for my teacher compared to writing something that's going online in our blog that will be, I can share with my family, my friends and other people and that they can comment on? Opens up whole new opportunities. Managing and operating ICT, selecting, using, understanding, <coughs> managing. I've got one big message on this one and it's really about pick the best tool for the job. And you know how that starts? That starts with identifying what you want to achieve. I'm a big um, believer that the tail shouldn't wag the dog. It's not, oh, we've got iPads and we've got Book Creator, so we'll do something with Book Creator today. It's... We're doing writing and I want my kids to be really confident with a narrative structure and we're going to use these tools to present that. So pick the best device, the best application, the best approach based on what you want to achieve from a learning and teaching point of view. And once you've done that, take it a step further. Get your kids to pick. You know, it's one of the things we want our kids to do is to be able to make independent decisions on the right tools for them. So rather than saying with an assignment, we're doing this and you will present it in, start moving back and giving them a couple of choices. And when they're confident with that, step back a bit further and give them more choices. Because that's an important skill they need to have as they head out into our world. Number four. Could they have not found a shorter title for this one? Seriously, applying social and ethical protocols and practices when using ICT. There's got to be a better way to say that. But anyway, so recognising, applying, identifying are the verbs. And there's basically three bits I see with this one. Part of it's about ownership and being respectful of the ownership of others. I love this slide. <coughs> Being a pirate is cool. Why did we call it piracy, you know? But really it's about helping our kids respect the intellectual property of others. And that starts with us. When we're modelling stuff, do we acknowledge the use of others? Do we ask permission before we take photos of our kids' work or ask to use something of theirs? It, it can be as simple as that, but they're watching for what you do, not what you say. And this um, can't be taught in an hour or a week's lessons at the beginning of the year. It's what you do every day. It's, it's, like, it's like the manners of the ICT world, something we have to work on all the time and work with people. The second aspect of it, of course, is the safety and the digital reputation of our kids. And again, it's modelling, it's discussing it, it's not being afraid to get out there and put things online. But what we know is... Our kids now have a digital footprint, often from before birth, because mum and dad are sharing their um, scans on Facebook before they even get out there. By the time they come to school, there are so many images 
and photos shared of them and then they start contributing to their own digital footprint. We need to give them opportunities in a safe environment to make mistakes and learn from them. When I was um, ICT coordinator in a, uh, Our Lady of Fatima, I used to open up email for our um, year fours. And I set, I'd set it up in the beginning that I could only email other people in school. And we had good filters on it and stuff. And invariably, they, particularly the boys, would have to test it and see what they'd do. So one day Josh wrote an email, Dear Amy, nobody likes you. We think you're a poo-poo head from um, Stacey. And Josh was really confused when I pulled him into the office and I said, talk to me about this email. And he said, but it's not got my name on it. Because he put it from Stacey. He didn't actually realise that in the header it was his name. <laughs> now, you know, that's, that's an okay mistake to make when you're in year four. But if we protect them and block them and don't give them those opportunities to fail and learn, what happens if that happens when they're 13? Because I've got to tell you, 13-year-olds, it's very hard to come back from something like that in your peer group. Or even worse, if we've protected them all the way through, that that sort of stuff happens when they leave school and they're heading out to work or university. I think we've got to give them an opportunity to have a go and to fail and to learn right from the very beginning. And I'm a big believer that this educating is always more powerful than blocking because the more we do it and the older they get, the much better they get at getting around things. I mean, I've been involved in conversations in schools where we've asked year fours and year fives to share the social networks that they're on at home. Absolutely horrifies the teachers. You know, they can sign into all sorts of social networks that are totally not age appropriate. So don't kid yourself. Your kids are out there doing it anyway. And if you're not there modelling it, who have they got to follow? Who are their examples online that show them good ways to do things? If we're not active online and we're not visible online, whether it's through Twitter or blogging or sharing, Pinterest, any of these things... Our kids have no good examples to follow. Kids have always looked up to us as teachers. That needs to happen online as well. That's my belief. So, that's our big picture. Not much to do, really. Yeah? yeah? Pretty epic. How do we do it? It's all very well to stand up the front here and say, this is awesome, this is amazing, do this. But meanwhile, back in the real world, all of you have to say, well, how am I going to make this happen? So, this is my thoughts on this. I think digital learning has three parts. First of all is the tool set. There is no doubt that you need the right tools and the right infrastructure. And look, we're increasingly living in a multi-device world. I wonder how many devices you brought today. Can I ask you to put your hand up if you brought one device? Two devices? Three devices? Four devices? More than four? You know, we didn't have very many at one. And that's the reality for our kids as well. Um, little video to share with you. So it probably shows my age. All right, check out this bad boy. 12 megabytes of RAM, 500 megabyte hard drive, built-in spreadsheet capabilities, and a modem that transmits at over 28,000 BPS. Wow. What are you going to use it for? Games and stuff. <laughs> So, um, well, pretty amazing specs on that for the time. <laughs> um, look, but seriously, it's not enough to have the good tools if you're not using them well. And um, I believe this in this one here very strongly. It's not enough to just have the shiny stuff. I found the whole digital education revolution very interesting where they provided all that money to put technology in secondary schools because I can tell you just putting technology in secondary schools made very little impact on learning. It's not about putting the stuff in. It's actually about what you do with it. So digital learning also needs to be a skill set. We need to know how to use this stuff. I'd be really upfront and say to you, if you're not digitally literate, you are not literate anymore. This is our world. It, we are now past the point. It's no longer OK to say, I'm just not good at this, or technology doesn't like me, or any of those other things. This is our new literacies that we need to be involved in. And the fact that you guys are here today means that you're already pretty committed to that, and you're going to walk away at the end of two days with a, a much stronger literacy base for this. 
I think there's, it, the scary thing about ICT is it keeps growing so rapidly. It's getting wide, there's a wider and wider range of ever-growing skills that you have to do in lots of different areas and in many ways that can be totally overwhelming. Where do I start? Because I looked at this a month ago and now it's changed again. And really, it's like most things, you know how they say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Pick one thing and focus on it and learn it until you get to the point that you do it well. They talk about um, there's four stages when you're going through learning something. You start with unconscious incompetence. You don't know that you didn't know it. Then you have conscious incompetence where you know you don't know it. Then you move to conscious competence where you've learnt how to use it, but gee, it's taken up a whole heap of your headspace. You have to think about it. It's hard work. You've got to move through it. You know, and this is normally the point where you're going, geez, it's taken me longer to create this than it is for the lesson for the kids to use it. But if you persevere beyond that, we then get to um, unconscious competence, where you've used it for long enough that it's automatic. A bit like driving a car. We don't think about everything we do when we drive a car. We got to that point where we're at unconscious competence. When you get to there, then it's time to take on a new tool. So I really support what Macy said this morning. Pick a couple of workshops, stick with it, work at it, until you get to a point that you are really comfortable with it rather than doing a whole smorgasbord. Because what we don't want is for you to have knowledge that's a mile wide but only an inch deep. It's much better to choose a few things and really depth your knowledge until you're really comfortable with it. Hi. But you know what, even having these skills, knowing how to use the technology as well as the technology working, still isn't enough to make a difference to our kids' outcomes. And really that's what we're all here for. So I think we also need a mindset. We need to know when, where, and most importantly, why we use these technologies. And I think, look, this is the biggest shift, this mindset thing, because it, it's really about us changing our practice and the way we work in the classroom. It's quite a big cultural shift where we're moving away from being the sage on the stage towards that guide on the side. And it's not just so much about getting there, it's more about the journey and how you view the journey. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on that. If you keep teaching the same way with new technology, it's, nothing's going to change. If you do what you always did from a pedagogy point of view, you'll get what you always got. And these um, bits of technology will be a very expensive failure. I do like this quote. We would never do that. We would never go, here's a great marker. Let's build a lesson around it. But some, for some reason, we do tend to do this with technology. Oh, I'm, I've got an iPad. Tell me things I can do with iPad. Or the next level is people go, oh, oh, I've got Book Creator. I want to do a lesson with Book Creator. This is not what it's about. It's about the learning. It's about flipping that and starting with, I want my kids to be really confident multiplying <laughs> two digits by two digits. How might I use the technology to achieve this? And if the technology can help you, go for it. If it can't, don't use it. Use a pencil. Sometimes a pencil is the best tool. But because we've been given these really expensive devices, we feel like we have to use them everywhere, all the time. When you are coming up with your activities, be very wary of substituting activities that you already do. Because, again, it's a waste of time. I mean, the, the classic example was used to, used to stand out to me is we used to write stories and we used to take kids to the computer lab to type them up as a good copy. So the only outcome we were actually achieving there was maybe keyboarding skills, whereas I'd much rather see it around the other way, that we do the drafting on the computer where you've got access to spell check and you can cut and paste and move the text around and consult with people and then do the good copy as handwriting. So you're building those skills. I believe not all tools are equal. I believe that you need to look for those tools that allow kids to show what they know. And this is done best with what I call power apps. And really, they should be said like power apps. And these are those apps you can use across the curriculum and across year levels. Because this is what we know about kids. We know the first few times they use an app, it's all about learning the app. 
And really you want your kids to get to a point where they're so comfortable using the app that they've moved to that unconscious competence that they're thinking about the learning. Because that's what we really want from them. So I'm a big believer of having a few apps, a few bits of software, and using them again and again and again in different ways. So it does become about the learning. Because we're all guilty of becoming appaholics. The next new app, it's always very exciting. There's always something fantastic and new out there. But it takes, it takes conscious effort to pull back and say, I only want the best for my kids. And one of your jobs is to actually be a gatekeeper and say, these are the best things that I want in my classroom that will best help our learning. I think when you're looking for those apps or bits of software, you really need to have a point of difference from home. What we know is that these kids are using devices from a very early age. iPads and iPhones have become the number one babysitter in restaurants for young children. I see it every time I go out. Kids play games and watch videos. So by the time they get to school, it's not really that exciting anymore. What is innovative for us is normal for them. So we need to have a point of difference. And I believe home is for consuming, for playing games, for watching videos. School is for creating, for using tools that allow kids to show what they know. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean I'm saying you should never have content on your iPad. But I'd love you to do an audit and look at your apps in your classroom and say how much of this is delivering preset content and how many of my apps are actually tools that kids can demonstrate their own learning. And if you have more content-based apps than creation-based apps, it might be time for a review. We need to think carefully when we purchase those apps and plan activities and find the things that are less, less about content and more about skills. Because what we know is if we buy stuff with preset content, we start fitting the kid to the content, whereas as teachers we know we should be fitting the content to the kids. Because every kid learns differently. Every kid's on their own journey. That's why we've spent so much time over the last decade looking at differentiation. We need to make sure that follows through in our digital world. And can I say learning is not about doing apps. It's my pet hate when I go into a school and they go, oh, it's great to have you here. We're doing Book Creator today or info, any other app in that place. You're not doing Book Creator. You're doing probably doing something amazing in English or maths or science or SOS that happens to be using that tool. So our challenge is to move beyond what we generally do when we first start, which is focus on an app and getting kids to know how to use it, to workflows where we're actually using a sequence of apps to build up a really rich work sample or um, display of work that the kids have been doing. To then integrate the digital and the analogue and then to actually move on to our kids designing their own workflows because that's what we want for them, to be able to make those really good choices with technology. The big question for us is who owns the learning? Because if you own the learning, we've got a problem. We need our kids to be owning our learning. So that means we have to give them authentic opportunities to solve problems and challenges for real world issues. We need to give them some ambiguity in our tasks because you know what? The real world is messy. The real world isn't going to fit perfectly into a workflow. Um, there's an interesting bit of research out there that says um, students going to university from private schools or Catholic schools struggle more than students going to university from um, public schools because they've been so supported and spoon-fed in their last couple of years of school. They don't know how to function when they have to be independent learners. We don't have to wait till high school to do that. We can be doing that in primary school. Oh. Um, interesting. If you have a chance, go and look up um, neverseconds.blogspot.com. This is a nine-year-old Scottish girl who decided one day to blog her school lunch because it was horrible. And so she blogged. She took a photo and she blogged every day what she got. She gave it a score for tastiness. She gave it a score for nutrition. Um, she even gave it a score for the number of hairs in it, which fortunately was mostly zero. And um, she commented on it. And she ended up with about 25,000 followers. Then a school found out and they told her she wasn't allowed to take photos anymore. So she wrote on her blog, she would have to close it, and there was this massive backlash. 
in social media to the point the school then had to back off and say, we need to think about this a bit differently. We need to involve you. And she had people like Jamie Oliver and other big influencers actually coming in and supporting what she's doing. She's now taken that massive readership that as a nine-year-old she's created and has started using it for a social good. So she's become involved in the charity Mary's Meals that provides food for students in third world countries. That's one nine-year-old who decided to do a blog on her own outside of school. What could your kids do with your support to change things in the world? I think we need to give our kids extra learning opportunities, ELOs. Sounds a bit like a music group, but yeah. What we know about our kids is some kids get it the first time. Some kids need to see it two or three times. Some kids need to see it more than that. And so one of the easiest things we can do is to start flipping our teaching. And by, by that I mean start recording the information that you're providing for your kids. Whether it's through a screencast, whether it's through using one of these tools, the top one is a snake clamp, it holds your iPad so you can video yourself or you can angle it and then you can video what's happening on the desk. Could be a handwriting lesson, could be a maths equation, could be an art technique. Or if you're working with a MacBook, something like the IPVO down the bottom, really powerful. Because when you record and share that learning, I don't have to ask again. I can watch it once, I can watch it three times, I can watch it more than that. When I go home and I have to do the homework you've set around that skill, if I've forgotten between nine o'clock math lesson in the morning and six o'clock at home where I need to do the homework, I can watch it again. And I can also watch it with my mum and dad or other family members who might be able to support me. So this is something you can do with one device in a classroom that will make an amazing difference for your kids. And they can access it in lots of different ways. You can put it on a learning management system or you can have it as simple as putting a QR code on their homework so that they can scan that and go and have a look or a link. So the challenge is for you guys to be what you want to see. You can't ask it of your kids if you can't do it yourself. And I'm a big believer in this quote from Alvin Toffler. The world is changing rapidly. We're not going to get there. Like if you learn everything we did over the next two days, you won't have arrived. You would just have moved on the journey. So really what you're looking for and what I'm hoping for you in the next two days is you develop your skills for learning of how you can explore new tools and how you can apply new schools so you are, are able to learn, unlearn and relearn because that's what we also need for our kids. And if we can help our kids do that, this um, suggested search on Google might change. <laughs> Try it today. You'll see that. It breaks my heart. What do you want it to look like if your kids were writing that one? School makes me... I want them to be able to say energised, excited, motivated makes me feel smart, makes me feel clever, makes me feel involved. School makes me part of a community. That's my hopes. So, my big challenge for you for the next two days. How are you going to use these fantastic tools that you'll be discovering to personalise the learning for your students? So you not only meet their needs, but also their aspirations. So, some thoughts for the journey. For digital learning to be effective in a school, it has to be every day, every teacher, every classroom, every student. So to make a difference, we all need to be doing this and we all need to be doing it well. It's not a competition. We're all in the business of maximising outcomes for all students. That's why we're all here from different sectors. We're not competing against each other. We've all got so much to offer one another. So the challenge is how you take people with you and share the learning. You're very privileged today that you've been released from your school. It cost your school to send you here. So one of the challenges, how will you go back and enrich someone else from what you've learned? You're going to have to be digitally resilient. There is no digital utopia with this stuff. Things break, things go wrong, things get blocked. 
Can I ask you to not spend undue time stressing about the things you can't control? One of the things about a cross-sectoral event is you'll hear that these people can do this in the other system and you can't. And there'll be things you can do that they can't. Worry about what you can control. They talk about those three circles, yeah? You've got a circle of control where you can, you can directly control what happens with those things. Then there's a circle of influence. It's things you can't control, but you can feed into and hope you might be able to change it. And then there's a big circle of concern, which is all the things you have no control or influence over, but really give you the whoops. Please spend about 70% of your time in your circle of control and have a look in your circle of influence and pick one or two things that you'd really like to advocate for to change in your school, in your system. Because if you spend all your time in that circle of concern, it will break your heart, it will run you down and you lose a lot of your joy in teaching. So go with the things you can change. Is this sounding a little bit familiar? Sad thing is now I'm part of the administration. Um, the challenge is to take our education leaders with us, you know. Whether they're your school leaders, whether you're, they're your system leaders, whether you're, they're your parents, you have to take them with you. So it's important you're an advocate for your work. You need to communicate, communicate, communicate. It's something we get into our classrooms and we do amazing stuff and no one knows. And we need people to be seeing what you're doing. And the most important tip I can give you that when you're communicating what amazing stuff you can do with your technology is be able to explain why it's so important. It's not just about the cool technology. It's not just about the motivation for the kids. Be able to explain we did this and it made a difference to my kids' learning because that's what gets administrators' attention and that's when you start to be able to change things. Expect the road to success to have a lot of twists and turns. That is the reality. And expect to feel a little bit uncomfortable because we're asking you and we're challenging you to change, to try new things and big things. And that is scary. And it's okay for it to be scary. Little bites, one thing, do it well. Then move on to the next thing. You can make a list of all the possibilities, but then put them away and do one at a time. And I'm going to ask you to get over the I'm not good enough. Get over the need for perfection. And when you've done something, share it with other people. Because we all need to have that support. And you know what? You tend to come to these things, and I've been in that position myself, where you think everyone in the room knows more than you and are better at this than you. And it's not until you're brave and you start sharing that you realise actually everyone's pretty much the same. They've all got strengths and weaknesses. They've got good stuff. I've often found one of the most powerful things to share is something that doesn't work. Because that's just as important learning for people as the stuff that does work. If I can save someone from making the same mistake I did, that's a win for both of us. So, as you move forward today, I have some buttons for you for the journey. I hope you play and explore and enjoy new things. I hope you fast forward your learning and rewind on some things you might need to stop doing. I hope you do stop from time to time, take deep breaths, re-energise yourself, go and get a cup of coffee, sit in the sunshine. I hope you slide to unlock all the possibilities that are, you can use with your devices in your classroom. And feel free to use the bin for things that don't work. Your job is to say, it would, I like this, I don't like this. Um, the people here over the next two days will show you a whole heap of possibilities, but only you know what will work for your kids in your context in your school. So you select which one you want to play with. And finally, please remember the smartest person in the room is the room. The people around you are doing the same work as you. They're experiencing the same successes and the same challenges. So please make the most of them. Ask lots of questions. Go and talk to people you don't know so that you can make the most of this time. Enjoy your two days and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>